fantastic to be back here in, in Barcelona. So to be in Barcelona and be called Ola and be a kickboxing world champion is not a sort of very common uh, trait. Did anybody try martial arts here? Raise a hand. Oh, we got some martial artists here. Well, for the rest of you, it's not a really sort of intelligent sport. Even if you win, you get beaten up and there's no prize money and there's, you know, very little fortune and fame. But it has one element that always attracted me. It's super exciting. So when I later on tried to find a job, I was thinking, okay, what can be as exciting as getting kicked in the head by strangers in competitions all around the world? And then I found the internet and digital opportunities. So since then, I've been building companies and uh, both in e-commerce and, and, and in most other, uh, many other different fields. And since 95, SIME has been gathering people in different parts of Europe to try to find out what's going on, what are the latest and most interesting digital opportunities, and can we learn and teach each other. So, um, how do you get the most out of SIME? I'm clicking here and something should appear behind me. It doesn't always. So, the spirit of SIME uh, and how you really suck the juice out of SIME is that you try to meet as many interesting people as possible. So what we've been trying to get together here is different meeting formats. So we will have a matchmaking session where you hopefully will meet most of the people that you would like to meet in this room. And there's a lot of interesting people. There are international leaders from media companies. There's even a pop star or two. Uh, there's people that have created 100 million euro plus businesses. And there's people that are set on doing it in the future. So hopefully we'll get you to get to know and teach and learn a lot more other people. So um, we have some other SIME housekeeping rules for the speakers. If you are a speaker and you're saying something really intelligent, but your time is up, chances are that this might happen on the screen behind you. So if everybody starts laughing in the audience and you're not really funny, this is probably what the audience is watching. That means you are out of time, right? Um, we also have a, a film crew, so that's why it's good you sit on the orange seats. Do we have our film crew here? S somebody filming? Yes, they'll come up here later on. So they will ask you intelligent questions and you will answer them. And this will be broadcasted on all other SIME events. We're 1,800 people in SIME Stockholm and there's thousands of people that go to different types of SIME events, from smaller settings like this to very big ones. So say intelligent things, they will live forever, okay? Um, some other things, um, yeah, digital opportunities. What I wanted to start out was to take you on a journey in digital opportunities. And, and, and something that, that really struck a chord with me was when Bill Gates said, the world will change more the next 10 years, and it has the previous 50. If you just think about this, think if the world would actually change more the next 10 years. What would that mean for your business, for our societies? Um, and um, that, I think we, it forces us to reimagine a lot of things. We need to think differently about our businesses and about a lot of other things in society. Rupert, can I get this screen to work over here? Thank you. The guys were out partying yesterday, so they're like really slow today. <laughs> but bear with them, they're a good team. So um, industries are transforming, and, and I mean, all of these things that used to look one way and function one way with one business model is changing dramatically. Uh, before, you had stacks of books and you were proud of them. Now you have Wikipedia, and it's just much better, much faster. You know all these things. Then, news were something you called in, you wrote about it. Now, this guy's twittering from the ferry, picking people up from the plane. You know, it's instant, and it's very different. Computer used to be really expensive and look really business. Now, they're entertainment products that everybody has in the pockets. Uh, just what happened to photography, before you needed to have very expensive equipment and few people were good photographers. Now everybody is a photographer and the amount of photos that are taken are tens of thousands more photos. So the business models and challenges are completely different. And if you were an old camera manufacturer, you're out of business. But if you see all the opportunities when millions of millions more people love photography, then you can create completely different businesses. Um, does this work? We'll go to, from digital to manual, this actually lights a light up there, wakes them up, and then they change the slide. See if it works. Yeah, good. So what I'm trying to get is that 
in this ever-changing world, we need to look at competitors in a different way. And if you just look at Google and Facebook, they're not competing with products. They're competing with complete ecosystems. They're complete competing with trying to own your mind in their platforms. When Facebook launched timelines, you all know the timelines, they will actually be able to tell everything you listened to, everything you liked, every photo you were on, every mail you sent, every place you were at for your whole life. So we'll be the last generation that doesn't have a perfect diary of everything that happened in our lives. If Facebook owns that, they will be the best marketing partner, they can sell us more things because they know us better than anyone else. It's a completely different thing than competing with the product. The like button, I think it's only one and a half years old or something like that. Every time you push that, you tell Facebook what you like. And then the other media or the other partners need to buy back that information. And now, more and more things, like everything you write, every verb, will be part of your social graph. Um, then they're going IPO. So uh, most of you probably follow that as well. And, and um, it's not really easy uh, to, to be Facebook on the stock exchange. But that probably doesn't matter, because they have one billion people this summer. And if only they launch a credit card, if only they launch a travel agency, if only they, they could be the biggest in every industry. So it's going to be very interesting to see where a company like Facebook will be going. Google also needs to be reimagined. They thought that search was at the core, that you start with search, and then if you knew what people were looking for, then you can sell wherever, or you can send whatever clicks or whatever they wanted to do. Now they're rethinking that, they're reimagining Google, and they say social is at the core. If I know who you are and who you know, then I can give you much more relevant ser searches. So they're rebuilding all of Google's logic, and they want to know who you are specifically. So we all will have completely different search results. They're also betting heavily on Google+. Plus. But the problem with Google+, Plus is a little bit, everybody came and everybody left. Uh, Facebook was sexy, it was fun, it was gossip. All your friends were talking about things. Where Google+, Plus more and more became a business tool, and they forgot what drives social. Social drives is driven by interaction and curiosity. Uh, they're going to do a bunch of different things. Uh, Larry Page, the founder, he promised uh, to change Google forever this year. They're going into pay TV. Uh, they're going to start Google Shops everywhere. So you will see a Google Shop in every corner where you can buy Google products. Um, they're going to go into enterprise. So it's going to be business to business, going head to head with Microsoft. They're buying video content so that they will be one of the, the players in the TV and, 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 and movie market. And they're actually building self-driving driving cars. And you've already seen this car. And when I saw it, I thought, oh, they're ridiculous. They're just spending lots of money on something stupid to impress people so they can hire good developers. But then I met the team behind the car, and their dream is just beautiful. They believe that the car will drive you to work. Okay? You don't have to be uh, involved. It takes you to work, you're just working, right? or playing around with your kids or whatever. Then it cannot hit other cars because it gets 1.6 million impressions every second. So it knows where everything else is. right? And then it cannot be in traffic jams, because they're slotted in. So in a perfect Google car world, there wouldn't be traffic jams. Um, on top of that, when you go to work and you park the car, you plug it into the grid and you give back electricity that you gather during the night. So there will be 800 million batteries going around, lowering the electricity cost. And if that wasn't enough, when you're, you're working, your car will be out driving as a black cab, you know, picking up people and making an extra buck for you, being part of a carpool, so we would need fewer cars. Could you imagine what a, what a completely drift, different uh, society and cities if this dream is true? Ten years, they say, and we will have this. So competition is fierce. It's Android versus Apple. It's Kindle versus iPad. And, and there's so many things going on with these big ecosystems that can be an opportunity for us as entrepreneurs, or it can be a complete threat. Um, I think Cool was created by Apple in this sector. And they're also doing things where we are reimagining, for example, books and television. The coolest thing that I heard that they're doing, they're actually, their vision is that every kid, when they start school, gets an iPad. And they have all the best learning material in the world everywhere, 
if you're in Sudan or if you're in New York, you have the best learning material. And you don't have to carry all these books. You just keep this, and then Apple sells all the school books in the world to all kids. That's also a big dream, but it's also a very important dream. Reimagining startups. When I started my first startup, we uh, had to build an e-commerce system. This was 96, 97. It cost $10 million, and when we launched it, it had 40% downtime where you couldn't use the service. Okay. You had to raise venture capital. It was super difficult to become an entrepreneur. Now, uh, there are billion-dollar companies created that didn't exist two years ago. It's just fantastic how fast value creation has been, uh, been enabled by these ecosystems and by another billion people soon joining the internet. This is something called Y Combinator. I think a lot of people of you know Y Combinator. They looked upon startups and said, why do startups fail? Well, a lot of companies shouldn't be started in the first place, and they didn't have the right coaches, and they didn't have the right ecosystem that helped out. Why don't we create like a university, and you go there and you apply with your startup, and as long as you pass your exams, you get more money. Now they get one application per minute from companies, and some of the most successful companies in the Valley right now is coming out like, are coming out like, from structures like this. Um, there's also international companies being created that you've never heard of. The founder of, 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 of ClickView uh, is here today to share some of his, his experience. He created a company which is worth as much as all the other Swedish IT companies put together from little Sweden. And the Swedes are absolutely crazy about the internet and digital uh, companies right now. Spotify is coming out of there. Klarna, SoundCloud, sort of, in, in Stockholm and Berlin. And a bunch of, a whole new generation of entrepreneurs thinking they can take on the world, right or wrong. Um, another thing that is completely different and very cool is marketing. Before, when we started our first company, we put $10 million into TV and hoped it worked. It didn't. Now you can know down to the last penny if it's successful or not. And we've only started. I believe we will have super powerful marketeers in the future. We'll have marketeers that tap into the Facebook social graph and they'll be able to sell you anything you like. And the people that dislike this feel it's my, my, private, my privacy, we shouldn't be doing this. But the people that I like it, they say, good, then I don't have to see tampons and, and diapers and other things that I'm not a heavy user of. I can focus on looking at things that really interest me. Um, you'll, we'll, we'll speak about advertising technology. We have a great company here, Plista, from Germany, that based on the context and what you're actually showing that you're interested in, they create banners, banners that are super relevant and use advertising technology to make a lot more money for the media company, but also get a better uh, experience for the ones that actually see the ads. We're also going to speak a lot about mobile marketing and sort of the buzzword of the year, solo mo, social, local, and mobile, and some of the implications that are having. Um, another fun thing that, that, that is happening when, when it's so many things going on at the same time, is that you can create very new alliances, alliances that weren't done before. So, for instance, Metro, the free newspaper, they invited Lady Gaga to become the chief editor for one day, and 300 million people engaged with this online. Their sales went up 38% just by letting a 24-year-old girl be the chief editor for one day. This could not have happened in the traditional world. Then uh, Chrome, uh, Google's browser, used Gaga to launch as well. So you launch a technology project with a video with somebody singing and millions of people engage with it. If I would have one teacher and, and mentor in social media, it would be Lady Gaga. Almost everything she's doing is absolutely perfect. She's, so if you want to study social networks, look at Gaga. Another cool thing that is happening is that uh, something that's called Town Hall. Instead of you uh, ha trying to get into Ofra Winfrey show or 60 Minutes and tell your beautiful story, you create your own stage. Like, for instance, Beckham on Google Plus, or when President Obama, he wanted to speak about unemployment. He didn't go to Opera, he went to LinkedIn, and they created a studio, and that was the broadcasting platform. And I think we'll see a lot more of narrow casting, of mini TV formats that can be very, very important. 
And I think also that, which is also fantastic, creativity has never paid back as much as now. Because if it's truly creative, it travels. This is the marketing director of Unilever. He says we have to have more magic and less logic. Because if we create things that are funny or quirky or strange, uh, it can connect with millions and millions of people. Um, and before, you had a campaign in marketing. It started and then it stopped, and then you had to buy a new one. Now something good lives forever, and something bad too. So if you have an event today, for instance, we film this. So what we say here today and what we do here today will live forever. Before, it was some wonderful hours in Barcelona. Now it lives forever. And that means you can spend differently on event or spend differently on creating things because it has a different lifespan. Coldplay, for instance, they don't want to go on a concert. They go to a little studio and then they do a YouTube concert. And they can have, they could be sold out, so to speak. Um, we have Ulf Ekberg from pop group Ace of Base coming here later on. They're creating a platform for artists so that any artist can have concerts around the world just being in their own studio. And that he believes that in the future, most musicians, small and big, they will have mini concerts for their friends using platforms like this. Uh, Tupac, the rapper that was shot in Las Vegas many years ago, he came back and he had a concert recently. So he was a hologram program. So in the future, maybe you will have, oh, I can only spend five euros on the concert. Okay, then you have to see the hologram concert. But if you want to see the real deal, then it costs you more. Um, online reputation can also be something very negative. Whatever you have done lives forever. And I think that will change completely the way we interact with people. If somebody saw all my Ibiza photos, I couldn't get a job anywhere, right? But I think that in the future, we will all have Ibiza photos. And there will be other things that you try to convey than that you're perfect and have never done anything wrong in your life. So reputation will be a huge difference in our society. And I think media uh, will, will, will probably be one of the battlegrounds where most things will change. We have many media companies here today. And before, when they, when they had, uh, you know, 20 years ago, they owned the audience. They broadcasted whatever they wanted to say. And then something else happened. Everybody started talking to each other. And all the cool companies, Skype and Facebook and Twitter and whatever, all had one thing in common. They didn't spend money on traditional media and they didn't have a brand manual. But what is evolving now, which is the next step, is when you combine these two things, when you combine broadcast media with uh, social media. And the ones that master that can change dramatically uh, as, as compared to their competitors. This is actually the Arab Spring looks like that. On the left hand side, you have Al Jazeera. On the right hand side, you have people with, on the streets with mobile phones. And I think that the future brands will be built like this, initiated broadcasted, picked up in social media, re-picked up by, by bigger uh, media, and then we will build new types of brands. Um, media companies are also becoming the new venture capitalists. This is Shipstead. They own a lot of companies here in, in Spain, uh, in the classified space, and everywhere else. They started out as a Norwegian newspaper. Now they built a portfolio with more than 10 billion worth of internet companies because they can use their media to create new companies. So for many of you entrepreneurs here in the audience, instead of going to venture capitalist, maybe you should knock on the door of a large media company and see what you can co-create. ProSieben, Germany's leading TV company, they're also here in the audience, they've created numerous companies. This is Salando selling shoes, for instance, where they take their TV and invest that and create a market leader every time. Uh, 2NT, social network, a place to meet friends. All of a sudden, they become a telco because they can use their social media presence to create new companies. And that's something that I, I think we will see a lot more. Somebody has a mandate to create more companies. My favorite era going forward, or, or area, is TV. If you look at television, um, you all have a computer or an iPad next to you, so the second screen is already there when you look, look at television. But what I think will happen is that when Real Madrid plays Barcelona. Okay, the coolest place is to be right there on the arena seeing everything. If you look at the broadcast live, you will be logged in together with all your friends watching the game together on the second screen. 
And maybe you want to have your favorite player and a camera following him, you buy that through your iPad and you see that all the time on your iPad. And maybe you want to place a bet with Puff. Okay, I place a bet. And all of these things will happen in real time and the TV program will know who you are, what you like, what you've transacted. And just by tapping, you can buy things from top model so so sunglasses to the trip to the place you're seeing in the movie and so forth. It won't happen in the television set. It will happen on the second screen. So I think two years from now, we'll be able to tell completely different stories and have a completely different TV experience than before. Um, and you can think about all the, the, the stories you can tell when you know exactly who you're talking to. Shopping is also going to change dramatically from the fact that e-commerce seems to be the only thing growing. Even when everything else goes down, e-commerce is gro growing. We're buying more things online. But also e-commerce is morphing. I like the Tesco, uh, the Tesco shopping wall. This is in the subway. So you go there, you just look at the product with your phone, and it's waiting for you when you come back home. So instead of having large stores in, in, in crowded areas, there will be photos of things that you can photo. Uh, and this is just a starting point. There's various models for digital couponing, and there are companies like iSettle out of Sweden or Square out of the US, where you just put a little dongle on your phone, and it's a cash registry. So you give somebody a massage, and you can just charge it directly. And all of these things are going to make it easier to shop things. Um, a quote that I like, what somebody said, the world used to be a place, now it's a space. It's not only where we are right now, it's what's going to happen here in the digital space and how that's going to live on before that. So I think we'll have a digital layer on top of everything. Uh, Ericsson calls it the network society. They believe 50 billion things will be connected 10 years from now. So everything will be connected. Every share here will have a chip. So, you, so whatever I, it would do with its chip, I don't know, but it will have it. And um, we'll have, you know, we'll be the last generation living in a stupid society when things don't have intelligence. Everything will have intelligence. And I don't know where that's going to go, but for instance, there's, this is an app where you sort of check your children's health based on a pool of lots and lots of doctor information. Um, there's another experiment where if you have a, a flu, uh, then they can look at wherever your phone has been close to other phones so you can see exactly who could actually be contaminated and you just look at your mobile phone communication or where your mobile phone has been positioned. Uh, there are examples of toilets that tell you what you should eat in terms of vitamins and things every day. And that's just the starting point. When electricity was invent in, uh, uh, invented, it was only to power the light bulb. Nobody thought of other applications than the light bulb, right? That's where we are right now with these intelligent things. Uh, this is at Ericsson's office in Sweden. It's a plant, and it tweets for water. So when it runs out of water, it's, it goes, so could you please give me some water? I'm so th thirsty. And it's very polite and a little bit English, posh. You know. and, and they were very proud of it. And I said, guys, is this really what you should be doing? You know, shouldn't you be doing other things? And they said, aha, I hope you would as answer that. And he showed a slide of a large agriculture field where they saw that if they apply this technology industrially, they could use 30% of the water. So a lot of the times, these things are quirky and fun and super powerful when turned industrial. So innovation is one of the last things uh, that, that I'd like to elaborate on. We really have to reimagine innovation. Innovation before was some guys usually guys sitting with white robes in a laboratory and then they invented something fantastic a long time later. Now it's a collaborative process where there's no way any one company can be ahead of all the other things happening in time, at the same time. Um, we, um, uh, I, I see a world where if you have cloud computing, so anybody can try something really, really cheap, you have performance-based marketing, so you can market and see if it doesn't work, I don't pay for it. And you're going to get one billion more people joining the internet. Of course, there's going to be more innovation that we've ever seen before. And I think that we're going into an era of hyper-innovation. Uh, everybody needs a digital strategy. Even the taxi driver I went to the airport with, very cool. Get into the taxi, and the guy gives me an iPad. And he says, sir, would you like to use my iPad? And I'm like, Okay, that's really nice. And he pre-programmed a bunch of things. So all the way to the airport, I was surfing on his iPad. And then he said afterwards, Sir, did you enjoy using my iPad? 
and I gave him two euros extra and tip. And everybody did that, he said, because I asked him. And he had like 20 rides per day. So he made 40 euros extra per day as a taxi driver for owning an iPad. And I think in a sense, that's just a very intelligent way of, and playful way of using what already exists, but on a traditional industry. Staying in the taxi industry, uh, this is a taxi app that the beer Bex created. So it basically addresses drinking and driving. So if you've been having some Bex somewhere, you're out partying, the phone knows where you are, you're in a bar, it pings you and say, are you drinking and driving? Uh, if you can't pass the Bex test, which is keep the key in the logo for 15 seconds, <laughs> you're drunk and it automatically calls a cab for you <laughs> and then you can go home. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's playful, uh, but it taps into things we're already uh, doing, or in this case, not should be doing. So this boils down to an age where I think it's going to be hyper-innovative. We're going to be a generation that, just like when music, my parents, they needed to play the violin to play music or, or, or the guitar. We don't have to do that. We download a, pro, uh, a program. Everybody can become a musician. And millions and millions of more songs are being created. I think the same thing will happen with ideas. We'll have thousands and tens and thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of new cool ideas. And we're just not going to be able to take them all in. So I think many companies will act as DJs, almost as shepherds, making sure that the relevant things that we see, and that can be a role in more and more industries, making sure that the relevant things uh, are picked. So finishing off with little case safari. Um, Pinterest, you've probably seen that. It's a very cool digital pin board. You put everything you like on it. It's a, like a Wikipedia for things you like. World of Horsecraft. Now it's finally time for the girls to get their World of Warcraft. It's uh, a beautiful online world uh, where girls ride around and hang out in the world of Horsecraft. We're going to see that later on today. Colin, the CEO, is here today. Mambu, social dating. I mean, when I'm dating, it's always social, but now you can have very social dating by tapping into the vast power of the social networks. And uh, we're going to see Gloria from, from uh, Mambu take us through how you can apply social on your businesses, but also if you want to get a date, how to get the most out of the social world. Um, if you want to be more traditional, this is Bharat Matrimony in India, combining tradition and technology. Marry away your children on this platform. Right? Um, Rap is another cool company, um, started in, in our part of the world in Sweden, where you can give gifts on Facebook. So you say, I want to give you 50 euros on Sarah. Anybody want to pitch in? And everybody pitches in, so you can get all your friends to give you a rap gift. And then you just print it and you go to Sarah and you have 500 euros worth of shopping. Or you can just give you five euros and Sarah pays for that because they want to have you into the store. And the more people that are doing that, uh, the better gift you get. So this is one of the fast growers right now. Um, when was the last time somebody tattooed your company's logo on your arm? When I uh, ask an audience that, very few people raise their hand and say yesterday or something like that. In, in the case of, of this company, Saab Scania, they build trucks. They were sitting and thinking, maybe we should create a Facebook for truck drivers. Like, like, a, like a stupid idea after going to a conference. And anybody who's a strategist on the internet would say, don't do it, it won't fly. Many times these strategists are wrong. They started a social network for truck drivers. And the truck drivers drive for four hours, then they have to wait for one hour, and then they log on. So every truck driver in the Nordics are part of King's Club. And it's super vibrant. And 2,000 of the truck, truck drivers own small firms. So now this is one of the biggest uh, selling they're, they're selling channels for new trucks through their social network, King's Club. And there's a trend to just show that you're really a hardcore truck driver. You tattoo King's Club's and, uh, and Scania's logo on your shoulder. So you have your car, you have your tattoo on, and on another uh, photo, and then you have your friends and so forth. So the playfulness and the creativity of the internet, I think that's what really, really attracts me about it and what makes it so fun to be in this industry. I was interviewing Richard Branson for a book I was writing four or five years ago. And I asked him, so who's an entrepreneur? And he said, well, an entrepreneur is not necessarily somebody who's starting a company in a basement. It's, it's anybody, it doesn't matter if you're a politician or have a big job somewhere, it's anybody whose dream of 
seeing it happen, his curiosity or her curiosity to see if it works is larger than the fear of trying. And I think that's a very beautiful way of looking at entrepreneurship.